Okay, we begin with our first company tonight. It's called Boat Rocker Media, which is an independent film studio located in Toronto, Canada. They trade on the TSX, TSX under the ticker symbol BRMI. Current share price, 97 cents. Market cap is 55 million. Shares outstanding is 56 million. And daily trading volume is 77,000, so pretty low. Uh, the company is classified, as you said, as a mature company and features partners like Netflix, Disney and Apple TV. So Bill, how exactly does uh, this company create content and sell it to the partners that I just outlined? Yeah, yeah so this is interesting. They're, they're a content producer. They, they make their own content. They come up with it for the purpose of selling it to uh, to groups. And we have a chart here actually we'll bring up of who they are, their clients are. They're selling to groups like Netflix right. and Apple TV and Prime and uh, Roku all over. And so this is a, a new business uh, globally. And, and I see this in different places I travel to. I see this in Mexico where there will be these studios getting put up and people will be filming content and reselling it to, uh, to these groups. And these groups, if you can produce interesting content they want to buy it at a, at a decent price so i'm curious to see because i've seen this having worked in this industry now but um yeah there are a, lar a lot of large media companies that do invest in these types of companies and eventually turn it in-house so based on the overall revenue and it's a viable market i would think this would be a good buyout target for a lot of these big major media companies would it not I think there's a potential for that, and that could be an additional care. And th this company too is into transactions. They had a a business unit that they sold out for uh, sold for fifty million dollars cash uh, earlier in this year um, that they they carved off. So this is a potential either to sell a business unit or to sell a, a large piece of the business or the business in the future for sure. You said if they sold the business unit, that was for fifty point three million, and the current market cap is fifty five million. So what's missing here? Yeah, you know, and also they, they, they have some good production. I think uh, some would be familiar with the show Palm Royal, uh, Orphan Black. Yeah. Um, they did some uh, non-scripted TV too as well. Um, you know, such things as Downey's Dream Cars with Robert Downey Jr. So this is this is interesting. And so, yeah, so we'll go through the finances and take a look. But uh, this is a viable business, making content, selling it. Yeah. Um, so this is something is the future. So it's it's worth it for us to take a closer look. Something we want to highlight each week moving forward is this like the 52 week range and how the stock has performed. I'm seeing 69 cents to two dollars and currently we're at 97 cents. So what's your views when what's your takeaway on whether or not um, again, this is not investment advice, but uh, what do you think of an entry point at 97 cents based on their 52 week uh, range? You know, it's middle of the range, you know, for myself, you, you, you'd prefer to buy stuff a little cheaper than more expensive, closer to the 52 week low. But there's other investors that say, you know, you want to buy it when it's already hit into its trend and it's, it's proving itself and building up some steam. So I'm going to let the viewers decide on that. But myself, I'll, I usually, I just make my decision based on the, uh, the financials of where they're at. Okay. Well, let's go to the charts and their income statements. Uh, the revenue over the past year, along with growth percentage, what did it show? So keep in mind, the company, as you mentioned, had a market cap of $55 million, yet they have revenue of $374 million. So this is Impressive. real. Uh, their three-year um, growth rate has been 28%. Last year, it slowed down a bit. The, these companies you know, uh, you know, know, have some ebbs and flows. It was minus 2% of revenue growth, but three years, they're coming along. But there was a couple of things I noted I liked. The gross margin was pretty good, almost 30% on making the content and selling it. So that, that's good. That's in fat margins. Yeah, but their FG&A is low because remember who their customers are. They don't have to go out and buy internet ads to go sell something or have a huge marketing department. They make something, they go to their, uh, their buyers and say, are you interested in this? Let's negotiate a price. And so because of that, their SG&A is, is very reasonable at 23 cents on the dollar. And so no surprise, they have EBITDA of almost $19 million in the last 12 months. These studios, are they often owned by the companies? Or are they leasing space? Do you know? I don't know that. Uh, there, there's one very close to uh, to me in Mexico in the beach area that we're at. And I, I did some research on it in the last uh, uh, time I was down there. It was interesting. It had a, a huge transition of changes. And that's where Titanic originally was made and was built for. Oh, yeah, uh, but someone it. came in as an investor. They, 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 they bought it in the last round. And now they're just making Netflix content in it. It's impressive. Times have changed, haven't they? Yeah, for sure.
Well, they have for quite a while. Um, what's their current working capital and uh, cash position yeah, showing? Yeah, so I looked on the balance sheet. So they have a they have a cash of 123 million with okay. a market cap of 55 million. So wow. that's a lot. But remember, they just picked up 51 million dollars in the business they sold. <clears throat> but they have some uh, current liabilities as well. So their working capital is only about four million. But their breakup value uh, was 100 million. So the idea is that if they sold off everything they had, pay off their debts. It's worth twice of what the market cap of the company is. That's a great find. Finally, their levered free cash flow. It showed what? Yeah, this gets a little goofy. So they had leveraged free cash flow of $110 million. That number is a, a little skewed because they sold the business and, and such. Um, so it's not going to be replicated every year. But yeah. it does demonstrate that they, they have no problem with cash flow. They have no problem with their balance sheet. They're doing really well. This is an interesting business. So I think, you know, if, if you're interested in buying a business, even, you know, that's in content, uh, they have assets that are greater than a market cap. Uh, this is an interesting find, something I'd be interested in. So moment of truth, I think we're going to get our green check marker. First one here tonight. Would you own this stock? 100%. I think you want to understand new media. You want to understand content. And so it's important for us to look at these types of companies. called Carbon Streaming Corporation, trades on Cebo Canada under the ticker symbol NETZ and on the OTCQB under the ticker symbol LFSTF. It's located in Toronto, Canada. Share price, 60 cents. Market cap, 31 million. Shares outstanding, 52 million. And daily, daily trading volume, very small at only 13,000. So first up, Bill, I'm going to ask this first question with all these stocks here tonight. What has been the 52-week range of this share price for the company? Yes, yeah, so the stock's been around 48 cents up to $1.19. So it's sitting at 60 cents today. So it's uh, in that range there, a little bit off its low. But it IPO'd for $5 in 2001, or sorry, 2021 just uh, uh, three years back. So it's way off from uh, where it IPO'd, where people thought it had uh, fair value at the time. So based off of that, um, and I know we bring this question a little bit later on, but I'll bring it up off the top here tonight. With this being down so much, is this a stock that's on sale or do you think it's a trap? Yeah, we'll find out. You know, So so this is very different from everything else we normally look at, at the uh, on the show. This is an asset play. You're buying... Uh, this is a long-term asset play for people that want something environmentally friendly. So what they what this company does is they invest in global projects all over the world. Um, they do, for example, reforestation. And okay. so they give a company money, maybe Brazil, Mexico, to plant trees. And then there's going to be a carbon offset that can be purchased by other companies uh, because of the uh, the environmental impact that this project has. So those trees aren't going to grow for a while. These are long projects. So they invest in it, and then they'll start monetizing these things on carbon exchanges in, gotcha. in years in the future. How long are some of these projects? Like, uh, do you have any idea how long? Some of the projects at? are going to start to monetize this year, but these contracts, some of them go out almost 100 years that they're going to be able to sell the value of the, the carbon. So the question is, there's twofold. One is, uh, the big one is, uh, what's the future of carbon pricing? Where is it today? Right. What's the right. future? The second one is, while you're waiting for the trees cr to grow, can you pay for the lights to stay on? Right. So, so right. that's the big thing. But what is unique about this company? I can't find anything else like this. Like, we'll put up a chart here. I was going to say, carbon, I've never... Yeah never even heard of something like this. So like, is there much competition that pertains to it? No. So here's seven ideas. If you want to invest in carbon, um, like one, you know, is Occidental Petroleum because they do carbon capture. If you invest in that, you're, you're actually buying an oil company that does some carbon capture. So that's not going to appeal to people that are environmentally friendly that want this. There's yep. an ETF that does a little bit stuff that tries to invest in companies that have some global carbon uh, footprints, but there's no pure play. This is the only pure play I could find in the capital markets where it's actually kind of like a long-term carbon bank that you're investing in this stuff for future uh, returns. So this is very well suited to someone who wants a pure play and that is very that wants an environmental play. Do you want to elaborate a little bit, a little bit more on what pure play, what you mean by that and why it's important? Well, it's the absolute opposite of something like uh, Occidental Petroleum. With that, you're getting a little bit of carbon capture and a big oil company. 
This that, is all carbon environmentally friendly. Let's think about this. It's kind of like a, a, a vegan goes out to um, a, a dinner and they have a plate comes to them with steak and some gravy on the potatoes and a little bit of corn. Well, they just get a little bit of the corn. But this is like going to a vegan buffet. It's only environmentally friendly type company that's focused on the carbon and, and the benefits to the environment. So this is a pure play that you just get that benefit. So a little bit more enhanced than a bunch of university students going up north in the summertime and planting trees. Absolutely. This is a, and this, these projects right here, we'll show a picture up here of where they are in the world. It's all over the globe. Yes, the company's based in Toronto, um, but this is a global company that's doing uh, these projects all over the world for the, uh, the benefit of the environment. Do we know who the CEO executives are within this company? Uh, they, they had, uh, they're on the website. There was on the investors deck. I wasn't familiar with any of them, but uh, this looked like a, a pretty interesting uh, idea. Okay. Let's go to their financials. Look like current cash situation is showing a lot, uh, what along with working capital. Yeah. So we're going to completely skip the income statement because it's a long-term play. So okay. like you mentioned on the balance sheet, they have uh, a market cap of 31 million. You can see here on the chart or the table. Uh, cash of 59 million, working capital of 47 million, but the breakup's 102 million of what they've spent. Um, that's not the net present value of the future cash flows. That's just what they spent of investors' money to invest in these projects. So because the stock's down, you're getting a $102 million investment for $31 million. So if people were excited at the IPO, nope, that down. it's way better to be excited now about this. Now, this is assuming that carbon prices don't really do much. Yep. Carbon price prices now have been between three and five bucks in the last few years. There is some uh, predictions from uh, Statistia that it could go as high as $238 a ton by 2050 if the world keeps up with what its global mandates are uh, for the environment. So this could be a huge upside if the world follows its plans in trying to reduce uh, the carbon footprint. Well, 100% they are. And on side with government officials, which is even more telling. But, yeah. you know, 2050 is still a long ways away. But if you factor in 3 to $5, what's that price look like even in five years from now? Which is pretty yeah. telling, to say the least, yeah. right? And we see this all the time. You purchase a <laughs> flight, you know, uh, with an airline. They say, would you like to offset your carbon uh, you know, for an extra fifty dollars, and this is how that business is done. This group is providing the backing so that companies can say something like that. You've also outlined here the breakup value. You want to explain what uh, what that means and well, the importance of it. So the breakup value is just what they invested in these projects with real cash. Um, this hasn't been marked up. You know, if the price of carbon goes up, this number doesn't change in accounting. We don't do that. Okay. Um, so if um, it, it, you know, they, they had a raise at their IPO. They had to raise, you know, a hundred plus million dollars to invest in these projects. Um, they invested in these projects. And now as a, a shareholder, you could have this for 31 million. So it's 30 cents on the dollar what previous investors paid. So it's uh, interesting uh, when you look at it that way. What a great find. All right. Finally, levered free cash flow showed what? Yeah. So it's negative $8 million. So they have runway to do this until the carbon uh, credits start coming. Their assets are, are growing if the value of the carbon uh, prices go up. Um, so they have runway here um, to wait. Uh, but eventually, you know, in two, three, four years, they're going to have to monetize uh, those costs um, and then get to break even. So this is a long term plan for people that want a carbon play uh, yep. in the market that's at a discount. Okay. So valuation is almost threefold from what it's currently trading at. So moment of truth, looks like green check mark time. You would own this stock, correct? Yeah, this is excellent for a carbon play if that's what you need in your portfolio. Okay. Well, that is a great find. That could be your best find yet. And now on to our third company as we head south of the border in the state of New Jersey. It's a company called Climb Global Solutions, trades in the NASDAQ under the ticker symbol CLMB. Current share price $102, current market cap $427 million. Shares outstanding $4.4 million, daily trading volume $2 million. So we're getting some action here, Bill. Uh, walk us through what the 52-week uh, range has been for this stock. So this stock has run up as well. Uh, it was uh, $40 at its low, and now it's at 102, which is its 52-week high. 
so people have wow. been getting excited uh, about this stock and what it's been doing. So what are people excited about? Why is it garnering attention? So this, this is a software reseller. And so what they do is they go into your company and right. they, they, they find out your, your, your business, what you're doing, and then they have solutions for you of software you probably haven't heard of. So all of us uh, have heard of Microsoft Office. We've heard of uh, QuickBooks, but we probably haven't heard of stuff like uh, Puppet, Zendesk, or KiteWorks, maybe. And so these are solutions that are very valuable, but it's just too difficult for these companies to individually market themselves. So instead, they go to a wholesaler like this that goes out and provides these solutions. So the beauty of this business is they get the upside of the growth of software, okay. but they're not spending money trying to develop software or trying to get the profitability. They're taking a suite of stuff to businesses to provide solutions. Okay. Notable names that they work with right now? Yeah. So we can pull up a chart here. It's it's huge lists. And so probably we're familiar with some of these uh, different ones. I know, for example, Zendesk was uh, something I've made use of before. Uh, okay. Open text, for example, as well. But these are all different things. And the idea is that a lot of these you're not aware of. So when they come to your business and make suggestions, there's value being added there. All right. So current share price of $102, market cap $427 million, daily trading volume of $2 million. But that is, like you said, the 52-week high of $102. So let's now go to revenue. Last 12 months in growth percentage is showing what? Yeah, so their, their revenue is $370 million. It's real. They had 11.4% growth last year. Over the last three years, they've been compounding just under 12%. Um, so that's excellent. It's, it's a growing business. They're catching the ride in software, uh, but they, get to, they don't have the risk of development. Okay. Gross margin then because of that risk is taken off is showing what? Yeah, it's almost 20 cents on the dollar. And then their SG&A is only 13 cents on the dollar. So okay. a lot of times we see that flipped over when it comes to software companies. And that's why they have a negative income for so long. But this has a EBITDA of uh, $23 million. So this is a successful growing business model. Hence the reason why you're seeing the interest. All right, balance sheet, current cash position, as well as working capital shows what? Yeah, they got $48 million in uh, wow. cash and uh, working capital of $21 million. So there's no concerns here. They're just uh, growing away uh, in, in a reasonably safe balance sheet as well. Okay, levered free cash flow. And, yeah, it was 20, $29 million last year. So they're doing just fine. The cash is uh, real. Uh, it's matching similar to their EBITDA. Okay. Before I ask whether or not you'd own this stock, do you think there's more upside potential pertaining to it? As long as software is growing and we, we know that it's just going to continue to grow, there's going to no be kidding. new applications come out and they need app, uh, they need marketing. And uh, so, you know, this is a, a viable business model for sure. That's great. All right. So this is the three, this could back to be one of the strongest companies you've ever covered. So you would own this stock. Yes. We got three green check marks, correct? Yeah, for sure. All right. company called Core Card Corp, New York Stock Exchange under the ticker symbol CCRD. They're based out of Atlanta, Georgia. Current share price, $14.39. Market cap is $115 million. Shares outstanding, relatively tight at $8 million. Daily trading volume, a little over $600,000 at $622,000. All right, 52-week range for the stock. It's showing what? Stock's uh, $14. It was in a range between uh, $10 and $22. But this was a stock that was uh, $50 some dollars around COVID. So it's uh, definitely uh, backed off. So what's happened? This is interesting. So this is a stock that was it has a long history as a company, but no one had heard of it until Apple and Goldman Sachs had this big plan that they were going to get into retail financial services. Okay. So Apple was going to, you know, have the card. Remember, and Goldman Sachs was doing all the banking behind it. Yeah. And all of a sudden they announced that they were going to use the financial technology of a company no one heard of in Georgia. And so this company just, you know, went way up. Um what happened to that story? Uh, Goldman Sachs has decided they don't want to be in that business anymore. Apple's still going to do it. That was the fault of Apple and Goldman had a lot of issues. Uh, Apple wanted the statements to be out on the same day for everyone. Uh, they wanted to issue cards to people with poor credit. Goldman yeah. took a big loss. Apple did it. Goldman said, okay, we're taking a loss. We don't want in this business. Hmm. So this was an issue because 63% of the revenue of this company came from that relationship. Oof. So no, you know, the the stock's down. So 
so that we have to look at this company to, to figure out a little bit more in depth, but that's kind of the story behind it. Did they Goldman Sachs really state in their press release as to what kind of issues they endured? Yeah, so it had nothing to do with the company. It number it, one, it was the demands um, that Apple had for unusual so, things okay. like statement dates. The second one was um, that the 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 defaults of the people borrowing the money off the card were much higher than they modeled. Nothing to do with this company. No one's ever said they were disappointed in the relationship with the company. Everything was good. Um, so they just happened to be an innocent bystander in this disappointing arrangement between Goldman Sachs and Apple. So you said 63% of what was that stat again? Of their, of their revenue was tied to this deal. So how have they been able to, I guess, pivot and maneuver since then? Well, we're going to take a look. Uh, yeah. So first of all, we, the big questions we have is, is, is their financials strong enough to rebuild? It, there's nothing wrong with their technology. They have to go out and present this to other groups. Yeah. That and, and 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 the other thing too is Goldman and Apple gave them the big check mark of approval. So now it's just a matter of time that they have to spend the next couple of years building up business again. The stock's been hit, we know that. But do they have the balance sheet to be able to go out and do this again is the big question. Well, let's look at that then right now and go to the charts. Revenue in the last 12 months, along with growth percentage, um, like you said, might have seen there's, there's a story within the story is what you just indicated, but what did you find here? Yeah, so so the revenue is $52 million. It's been down, as we know, from the previous numbers I quoted. Part of that's already in the revenue number. Yep. But what was neat when they were humming along, um, even this year, their gross margins 32% and their SG&A was only 12. Wow. So, so they were healthy. making a big transaction charging Apple and Goldman for this relationship. And so they came out with an EBITDA of $7.1 in the last 12 months. So that tells you when they're partnering with people, they had something that Apple and Goldman were willing to pay for good margins. Yes. So there's something there at least. All right. Moment of truth time. Let's look at their balance sheet. What's the current cash position? Well, and this, yeah. So here now we look at it. You know, they, they compared to their $150 million yeah. market cap, wow. they got $27 million of cash, working capital $32 million, and their debts are only 17% of their assets. So they have a breakup value of 50 million and a credit rating of 9.4. This is a strong balance sheet that this company can go back and rebuild. So what am I missing here? Why did Goldman Sachs get out of it when you see numbers like this? Surprise. Well, me. this company charging fees to Goldman was excellent. Right. But Goldman right. wasn't happy with their cut of the deal. Gotcha. So when you look at this relationship, there was a three-way partnership. This company loved it. They were collecting good margins. Apple liked it. Goldman hated it. They got the the end of the the stick, and gotcha. so the Goldman says, "I want out." Yes, uh, but the the other groups, you know, it still was a was a good business model. Yeah, makes sense. Now I completely understand. All right, levered free cash flow was what? Yeah, so it was uh, it was pretty flat, but that's because they spent close to nine million dollars on research and development, and that's going to bring them new ideas to bring to other groups and to pivot. That's so. A good point. Uh, yeah, so this is something that's interesting. It's 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 you know if you look at it, there's a big story here. You have to really read and do some research, but it looks like a, an interesting play. Okay, moment of truth. Would you own the stock? Absolutely. You know, I think it's a, an interesting play. It's beat up. They have a strong balance sheet. Uh, Goldman and Apple loved what they were doing. It's just well, that Goldman didn't like the defaults. Yeah, and I can see and understand that now. I'm glad I asked that question, but it totally makes sense. Hey everyone, thanks for watching our latest podcast. What'd you all think? Is there any information that we're missing? Is there anything you want us to cover? As these industries heat up, we're getting access to more and more big hosts. So let us know the questions that you want us to ask for you. As usual, smash that like button. We want this to go viral. Click on that bell for all notifications for the latest interviews that we're doing. And as usual, let's build this community. Subscribe to our channel because we appreciate it. Because we wouldn't be here without you. Thanks for watching, everyone.